morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sabrina Devone, and I will be the moderator for our presentation. I am part of FLOR's Office of Technology, which focuses on using science and innovative engineering technology to build a better world. Our engineers, designers, and experts, our people, are at the core of our success. As with other webinars, this will be a technical presentation intended for anyone who is interested in starting a discussion about the challenges that industrial facilities face in setting their operating and strategic plans, what some solutions to those problems might be, and what to consider when energy efficiency is on the table. Everyone from mechanical, process, and utility engineers, environmental compliance staff, to reliability and operations staff will benefit from the discussion that we will have this morning. With us today is James Turner. James is an executive process director with over 30 years of experience at FLOR. He manages process designs for many refinery and petrochemical projects and has published and presented more than 25 technical articles about process design and project execution. James tries to stay fit by cycling and running wherever he is. He says he doesn't play anymore, but he was his college champion in table tennis. Joining James is Philomena De Greco. Philomena is a process engineering manager with more than 15 years of experience in the industry. She has been involved in several studies focused on reducing utility requirements, increasing overall energy efficiency, and reducing emissions. She is part of Floor Sustainability Group and leads the Energy Efficiency Experts Area in our, in our Amsterdam office. Philomena loves baking cakes, and during her free time, she tries new recipes and invites friends over for a tasting. Floor has a very strong safety-driven culture, and as such, it is customary for us to start our meetings with a brief safety topic. Philomena, will you please unmute your line to begin with a safety topic? Thank you, Sabrina. While higher energy efficiency is usually the best approach in design, there are times where a lower energy efficiency design may be required due to process safety requirements. As an example, hydrocrackers often have a minimum fire detail duty so that the heat input to the process can be removed quickly during an abnormal event, such as a sudden increase in the reactor temperature, which could lead to a runaway reaction. Shown here is a high-level PFD of a hydrocracker reactor loop. The hydrocracker process is exothermic. Heat is released as the, as the reaction occurs, causing the temperature in the reactor to increase. The temperature in the reactor is typically controlled by mixing in a colder feed material. Usually this is done with the recycled gas, as is shown here. The rest of the recycled gas is mixed with the fresh feed and heated in the feed effluent exchangers. In many units, it would be possible to design the feed effluent exchangers to provide all of heat input to meet the reactor inlet temperature. In theory, bypasses of the feed and the recycled gas around this exchanger could be used to control the reactor inlet temperature without any duty in the fire heater. But then you would lose an important control mechanism the ability to manage upsets by quickly reducing the fuel to the heater to reduce reactor inlet temperature as fast as possible. We need to keep in mind that there are times where the maximum energy efficiency is not achieved due to safety requirements. We know there are ways to adjust this design so that the unit could achieve higher energy efficiency while targeting the required safety. Typically, these units include the fresh feed preheat using some of the unit products from the fractionator. By designing this exchanger with automatic bypasses, it may be possible to provide the required safety while having a much more energy efficient design. Hydrocracker are typically licensed units, so we would need to work with the licensor to get them to accept this type of approach as clients look to develop more energy efficient designs. So that's our safety topic for today, which is directly applicable to energy efficiency. James, I will pass it to you to start our main presentation. Thanks, Philomena. 
As an introduction to the topic, I'm going to quote from Alan Rossiter in the book, Energy Management and Efficiency for the Process Industries. In the book, Alan puts forth two axioms, which he calls laws related to industrial energy management. Law one, there is no silver bullet. No single method or technology ensures that energy use will be optimized. Law two, I don't know it all and neither do you. So with those two laws in mind, we'll press on to discuss how FLUR approaches energy efficiency and strives to provide highly efficient designs for our clients. Many companies are focused on decarbonization, reducing the CO2 emissions or carbon footprint for their facilities. Today, we will talk about how improvements in energy efficiency can be part of a company's overall decarbonization plan. Specifically, we'll talk about energy efficiency in industrial facilities. We will talk about what designing for energy efficiency means to FLOOR, what specific techniques and procedures we use to assure clients that the resulting design is energy efficient. We'll give specific examples from some of our past projects. According to the US Energy Information Administration, EIA, the industrial sector accounts for 33% of total energy consumption in the United States. Worldwide, the International Energy Agency, IEA, reports that industry accounts for 37% of total energy consumption. With either statistic, it's clear that industry uses a lot of energy. So even modest improvements in energy efficiency for an industrial complex may have a noticeable impact. Improvements in energy efficiency are one of the few decarbonization strategies that can offer a direct return on investment without subsidies or government mandates, in addition to the decarbonization benefit. Sometimes there's other additional benefits in implementation of energy efficiency ideas. For example, flare emissions may be reduced if leaks and relief valves that go to the flare system are fixed. Water consumption for makeup to cooling towers or steam boilers may be reduced if demand for these utilities goes down, and maintenance costs may go down if reduced fouling exchanger designs are implemented. Shown here is data from the U.S. Energy Information Agency that shows industry energy consumption by type of industry. The survey tracks fuel consumption, including electricity and hydrocarbon fuels, and feedstock non-fuel consumption. Chemicals production and refining are the two largest energy consumers. Based on the 2018 report, which was released earlier this year, they account for 45% of all industry energy consumption for fuel. That's what we will talk about today, energy efficiency for refining chemicals and petrochemicals production. The same EIA report notes that from 1998 to 2018, industry energy intensity has decreased by 26%. So we've made some significant project in, project progress in the last 20 years, but there's still a lot of opportunity for additional improvements. The two primary ways for an industrial facility to improve their energy efficiency are by having a good design and by good operations practices. Shown here are some of the main techniques that can be applied to improve energy efficiency and whether they apply to operations, design, or both. These techniques can make a significant difference on an operating facility's energy consumption. Some techniques apply only to operations, such as maintaining equipment and fixing leaks. Likewise, some apply only to design, but there's also a lot of overlap where techniques can be applicable to both operations and design. As an engineering and design company, Floor has the most impact on the design column in the table. Optimizing the design of a facility to provide the best possible energy efficiency. Looking at the high level techniques that can be applied during the design of a, of a facility, they are designing the controls that manage the operations, applying energy efficiency best practices, benchmarking designs against similar units to highlight areas that may be ripe for improvements, optimizing the design of heat recovery equipment, and choosing the process scheme and equipment based on their relative energy intensity. Many operating companies have developed energy optimization programs with energy czars to lead teams in reviews, support benchmarking and ongoing performance measurement of facilities and units, and encourage projects that will improve energy optimization. In the past, 
We've not typically seen the same focus applied on capital projects where an energy efficiency leader is named and specific measurable goals are defined and tracked. But maybe this is a good idea to consider for projects to use this type of approach also. Let's talk a little more about specific tools and practices that we utilize. Some of the energy efficiency tools and practices that we apply on our projects are use nested layers of optimization, develop good utility balances, calculate energy intensity, use proven concepts and high performance equipment and design, help equipment and technology suppliers optimize their design and select the most energy efficient offering, utilize value improving practices, and ask what if. Now we'll discuss each of these techniques. One recognized practice is to start with large systems and work your way down to smaller systems. This is sometimes called a top-down approach. This is most applicable for new facilities. Let's say you're working on a design for a new petrochemical complex. You would start by defining the utility systems, including the steam levels, fuel properties, cooling water and air cooling conditions, etc including the cost of these utilities. Developing an economic basis for the value of reducing fuel consumption is also important. Appropriate factors for the additional cost of carbon capture or greenhouse gas emissions penalty should be included. Understanding how the preliminary utility balances shake out is also important. It may be better for a new facility to plan for a high level of component recoveries to make the fuel gas system smaller and for a high level of electrification to maximize electric motor drivers instead of steam turbines. There are several factors that go into these decisions. This is discussed in more detail in a previous Innovation Builders webinar on electrification that's available on the floor.com website. Once you know the main process flows between units, you look at what conditions you want for these streams. What temperature and pressure do you want these streams to be at to go from the unit to storage or to another unit? In many cases, running most of a stream hot from one unit to the next unit can improve the overall energy efficiency of the complex. However, startup, normal shutdown, emergency shutdown, and other abnormal cases must also be considered. Decisions such as whether each unit will have hydrogen makeup compressors or if there will be combined or centralized systems are also made at this level. Once these conditions are determined, the basis for each unit can be defined and each unit can be optimized within its requirements and constraints. Once the unit systems are defined, each subunit or piece of equipment can be analyzed. By performing this analysis in NEST, from the top level decisions down to equipment specifications, the overall efficiency can be optimized. When this approach is not used, the result is often that savings that could have been obtained by looking at the higher level interactions are missed. In a minute, we'll talk about calculating energy intensity for individual units. In order to effectively determine the energy intensity for a unit, you need to have a good overall utility balance. This applies to the design of new facilities, but it's also a critical first step for existing facilities that are implementing an energy optimization program. The first step in any program is understanding what you currently have. On several projects we've worked on, the facility did not have a good current steam balance. In order to determine if proposed project changes could be achieved, we had to help develop the steam balance. While doing this, we identified optimization opportunities that were originally outside of the project scope. We invest a lot of effort in developing the steam balance. What are the different levels of steam and condensate? How do they interact? What are the steam flow rates to and from the various units and pieces of equipment? Non-normal operations cases such as startup or when individual units or equipment are down are also important to understand. The importance of understanding the overall fuel gas balance is also critical. Many facilities produce a lot of gas that ends up in the fuel gas system. And if they achieved all of the energy optimization that might be available, they would go long on fuel gas. If this is the case, investigating ways to recover heavier hydrocarbons and hydrogen from the fuel system, or perhaps to modify units that are producing a lot of light ends to operate differently, may be very worthwhile. This could have a good payout based on the product values and also enable energy efficiency steps that would otherwise not be feasible. 
Philomena, please cover the next topic. Thank you, James. The energy intensity for a system is the energy consumed by the system divided by the amount of usable product that the system produces. EI can be calculated for a country or a company or a facility, a refinery petrochemical unit, or even for a subunit or a piece of equipment. The energy intensity is not a grid, and you cannot learn much by comparing the energy intensity of different processes to each other, such as comparing a crude unit to a hydrotreater unit. However, by comparing the calculated energy intensity to similar units and available benchmark data, you can get an indication of how your design compares. For a refining or a petrochemical unit, the energy consumed can generally be considered the sum of the fuel to the heaters, the net energy of, ste the net energy of steam and condensate consumed or produced, electricity consumed. We generally exclude the energy value of products produced in a unit and also in, feed uni in unit feeds. In order to come up with the overall energy consumption of a facility, all of the energy needs to be converted to the same basis. This introduces the concept of primary energy and secondary energy. Typically, fuel is considered the primary energy source. Incremental steam for a facility is typically generated by using fuel, so this conversion may be relatively straightforward. The key is to apply an efficiency for the generation of steam, secondary energy, from fuel, primary energy. This accounts for the loss of energy in transformation due to less than 100% efficiency in the steam generation. Similarly, for electricity, there should be an overall factor to convert from electricity to fuel. That should take into account the lost energy during electricity production and transmission. This factor can vary significantly depending on the source of electricity and can be a complicated and sometimes controversial subject. In the future, if electricity is produced from primarily non-fuel sources and direct fuel consumption for a facility is low, it may make more sense to develop the energy intensity using electricity as the basis for primary energy. However, it will be important to consider the impact that this could have on benchmarking comparing to facilities that were benchmarked with fuel as the primary energy source. In addition to the energy conversion basis, there are several other factors that, that can affect the energy intensity, which may be different from site to site or even unit to unit. One huge impact is the definition of usable product. An example is a nafta fed sink cracker. Are all products considered useful product? Just ethylene, ethylene plus propylene? We have seen clients make very different assumptions, which can have a huge impact. Other items that can have an impact while trying to compare to units are the feed variations, such as the crude type for a crude vac unit, feed properties for a hydro treater, and so on. Product specification and unit objectives, battery limit conditions, utility constraints. So you need to be careful when comparing energy intensities for different units to try to normalize as many of these variables as possible. If you're looking for benchmark data or references from other, for other units, where can you look? Potential resources of benchmark data are other unit designs that may be available, data from publicly available sources, such as European Commission's best available technique reference documents, or the US DOE energy bandwidth studies, data from subscription organization sources. If you want to compare units, if possible, it is better to get the actual utility consumption values and product flow rates and calculate the EI from those values instead of asking the licensor or, or site to do the calculations and not know if the same, base, uh, same assumptions were made. Floor has developed 
a standard spreadsheet template, which is typically used as a starting point for calculating energy intensity for units on a project. This file is typically modified to create a master file for the project, where the project units, steam conditions, and the energy conversion factors are spe specified and made specific to the project. The spreadsheet format is shown here in this slide. This one uses SI units and has three levels of steam, but it can be customized to reflect any facility design. All of the steam, condensate and electricity energy values are converted to fuel equivalent value and the net energy consumption for the unit is calculated. The desired plotted flow rates is an input, usually from a unit material balance. The energy intensity is then calculated by dividing the net energy consumption by the desired product for it. James, let's go back to you to talk about other techniques that Floor uses. Thanks, Philomena. On this slide, we've grouped several energy optimization concepts under a common heading of use proven concepts and high performance equipment. In order to design the most energy efficient process, you need to have the right expertise to optimize the system, as well as optimize the individual equipment. We have expertise in designing fired heaters, heat exchangers, and compressor and pump systems to be highly energy efficient. We also have very experienced process engineers to make sure that the combined design is effective and efficient. One tool we use is heat integration analysis software. One of the examples that we will discuss later touches on this subject. Understanding how to apply mechanical vapor recompression or heat pumps for fractionation systems with similar boiling points and designing gas separation plants to optimize the required compression energy can also be important. Optimizing control schemes so that the process requirements are met while minimizing energy consumption is important. Exchanger designs using plate and frame, twisted tube, and helical baffle designs can make a big difference in the overall energy intensity of some processes. Designing the equipment to reduce exchanger fouling can also be important. We'll talk about that concept in one of the examples. Working with equipment and technology suppliers to optimize their designs and then selecting the most energy efficient offering is also important. Many projects are including energy scoring as one of the major criteria for deciding on vendor or licensor selection. Invitation to bid inquiries typically ask for enough information to allow us to calculate the energy consumption for the vendor or licensor's offering. On some projects, clients ask us to calculate annual operating cost, which the energy consumption may be a large part of, so that system lifecycle costs can be calculated. This can provide a fairer evaluation and gives providers that have more efficient designs but higher capital cost a fair chance to win the bid. We found that many times we can work with technology and equipment suppliers to further optimize their offering and reduce their energy consumption. This is also sometimes an opportunity to effectively apply a nested layer optimization. Sometimes after we, we receive the bidder's proposal, it prompts us to make a change in an upstream or downstream process so that the overall system design is optimized. Project schedules during the procurement process do not always support this type of optimization. So it's often advantageous to get preliminary technical proposals from potential suppliers to support the overall optimization up front. There are several value improving practices that are applicable to optimizing energy use in a facility. The typical project will have a VIP selection workshop at the beginning of the project where Fleur and the client jointly agree on which VIPs will be performed for the project, what procedures will be used, and who will facilitate the VIP and manage the results. VIPs that we use that apply to energy optimization are energy optimization, technology selection, process intensity, process simplification, design to capacity, and zero base execution. We've successfully applied these to improve energy efficiency for facilities we design. Energy optimization is an interesting VIP that's been used successfully on several projects. It uses a combined client and floor team, including subject matter experts on both the process technology and energy optimization, and typically includes a focused review of the facility's process flow diagrams, the use of a checklist of potential ways to improve energy efficiency, 
and team brainstorming on any ways to improve the process. I have found that even when the team thinks the process is well understood and optimized prior to the meeting, there's still a few ideas that come out of the session for ways to further improve. The next four are pretty common VIPs, so you probably have an idea what they're about. They're related to energy efficiency because often, if you simplify the process by removing equipment or reduce the size of equipment, this will also reduce the energy consumption. And certainly, technology selection can have a large impact on energy consumption. The last one, zero base execution, was developed by Floor, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail to explain it. The traditional approach is that a scope of facilities and set of project specifications are based on past projects. PFDs and equipment specifications are often copied without an understanding of what may be different for the new project. I've seen this myself when I reviewed a design that was clearly copied from another project for a similar unit, but with a different feedstock, and included equipment that was not needed for the current project. After the initial design is established, there's often a late value engineering exercise where some flexibility is removed and some specifications are no longer required. The result may be a hodgepodge design that's less expensive than the original design, but with less flexibility and higher operating cost. Zero base execution is a paradigm shift or mindset change. It's an overall approach to build a design from the ground up by fully understanding the finished facility requirements starting from zero to determine what is truly required instead of starting with a previous design or set of specifications and determining what you might be able to cut. This approach applies to the facilities themselves where each piece of the kit needs to be justified or added based on the value it will provide. It also applies to the project specifications and even to project sourcing, modularization, and execution strategies. Items like sparing philosophy, equipment design margins, and metallurgy specifications can also be optimized from this approach. There's some overlap with some of the other VIPs, but the zero-based execution, execution concept pulls it all together and makes sure that the final design is fit for purpose and meets but does not exceed all project requirements. As we put together this webinar, we got input from several groups within FLOR on energy optimization examples. In fact, there were many more examples that we didn't include because of time constraints. I was curious if there were any common themes from the examples. What I realized is this. The best ideas come from a knowledgeable FLOR engineer working to solve a problem. It needs to be an engineer that understands the process, including the goals, process variables, and how they are interrelated, has an understanding of equipment designs, and how energy consumption has been optimized on fast projects. With this information, the engineer can ask what if and explore how changing the process, sometimes to use an entirely different looking process, sometimes making relatively small improvements, can make a big difference on energy consumption. When we go through some of the examples, I hope you will also recognize this common theme. Now I'd like to address potential challenges to energy efficiency. What can keep designs from being as energy efficient as possible? Philomena talked during the safety topic about how other process requirements, sometimes safety related, can be a potential obstacle to optimum energy efficiency. We also briefly mentioned utility balance impacts. If the facility may be long on fuel, gas, or steam, then better energy efficiency may not appear to have a payout. Often a more energy efficient design will have a higher capital cost. Projects should determine the true best life cycle cost, including all factors, but historically many projects did not do this and were driven only by lowest capital cost. Finally, there's often resistance to make changes even if the changes only improve the operation and reduce energy consumption. Proposed changes should undergo rigorous scrutiny, and all management of change procedures must be followed. But these necessary procedures should not stand in the way of changes that can make the operation better. I'm reminded of the story of the military base manager that took over managing a base. The outgoing manager told him, you need to always assign a soldier to guard that bench out front. Why do we need to do that, he asked. I don't know, the general told me to do it, so I did. Being curious, the new base manager tracked down the general, who had now been retired for several years, and asked him, 
Why do we need to have a guard watch that bench? The general replied, is that paint still wet? A humorous example, but I've seen several times in operating facilities that procedures continue to be followed long after the initial reason for them no longer applied. Now we'd like to go through a few case study examples from past projects. The first example is for the design of a cloth sulfur plant quench tower direct contact condenser or DCC. This idea and these slides are from Henry Kister. Henry Kister is a recognized global expert on fractionation design, operation, and troubleshooting. He's also done an innovation builders webinar on a different topic. Shown here is a PFD of the typical process for the direct contact condenser. Coming from the hydrogenation reactor, the stream is hot. It needs to be cooled to about 50 degrees C before going to the absorber. The typical design uses direct contact quenching with a two pump around system. A bottom pump around for desuperheating and a top pump around for condensation of the water. All of the cooling in the system is provided by cooling utilities. For locations that have ample cooling water available, this is typically done with an air cooler followed by a cooling water exchanger and a pump around system. For locations where the cooling water is too warm, using cooling water may not be a solution. In this case, a closed loop refrigeration system is typically used to provide the trim cooling. Refrigeration is very expensive and very energy intensive, so there's a strong incentive to minimize the amount of refrigeration duty needed. For the example case, we've shown the duties of the air cooler and refrigeration cooler, as well as the temperatures in the process for the typical design. More than half of the total duty is required to be supplied by the refrigeration. Here you see the results of our optimization. We split the condensing section into two separate pump arounds. The bottom pump around uses the air cooler and the top pump around uses the refrigeration cooler. By having separate pump around sections, we can actually get a lot more cooling from the air cooler and the refrigeration duty is significantly reduced. A patent for this design was awarded to Henry Kister in 2015. Here we put the conventional design and the improved design side by side, so you can clearly see the results. The overall energy intensity of this part of the process has been reduced by about 40%. What are the consequences of this design improvement? The two pump around system actually makes the packed bed cond condenser more efficient, so the required tower height is also reduced. This impact, plus the lower refrigeration duty, makes the total capital cost lower for the two pump around design. So this is win-win, better energy efficiency and lower capital cost. For any locations where refrigeration would be required, or if cooling water costs are much more than the air cooling cost, which is often the case. The next example I'd like to talk about is the floor solvent process. This, this process has been used successfully for many decades for bulk removal of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide from gas streams. For several applications, the floor solvent process provides significant advantages over other approaches. The process is well suited to removing large amounts of carbon dioxide from natural gas and syngas streams operating above 300 PSIG. One application that looks particularly interesting is removal of carbon dioxide as part of a blue hydrogen production process. The process uses a physical solvent and uses pressure flash regeneration of the solvent, so no heat input is required. This significantly reduces the, the energy intensity of the process compared to amine systems. Shown here is a simplified PFD of the process. Due to time constraints, I'm not going to go into more detail. Depending on the application, the floor solvent process can have an energy intensity 30 to 75% lower than a specialty amine system. In most cases, the capex will also be lower, another win-win scenario. The next example we have is Flourish Cryogas Deep Dew Point Process, or DDP. We have a whole Innovation Builders webinar on this process, so you can watch it to see the details. We included it here since one of the features of this process is improved energy intensity, typically 10 to 15% less than the most common competing process. Philomena, please go ahead and cover the next few examples. Thank you, James. 
As previously mentioned in the introduction, one of the techniques to improve energy efficiency is to optimize the design of its recovery equipment. Throughout an industrial operation, heat is added or removed from one process stream to another. Heat transfer equipment contributes up to 30% of pro process capital costs and 90% of operating costs. Designing heat transfer equipment effectively can create a huge economical benefit to any operating company and greatly helps in reducing the CO2 emissions. Floor's team of heat transfer engineers has the expertise and in-house design capabilities to deliver fit-for-purpose, cost-effective solutions to clients in order to maximize return on their assets. Integrated heat transfer solutions offer economical benefits such as equipment cost savings, reduced energy costs, and increased energy efficiency. This is the case of the example summarized in the table in this slide. The initial design of the light sensor on the left was based on a traditional approach with high filing factors and over design on duty. As a result, the exchange had a large surface area, 1300 square meters, more or less, in four shells, two in parallel and two in series. With this design, the fouling tendency was still high, as it can be noticed by key thermodynamic parameters like the fluid velocities, the B flow fraction for the shell side, and the shear stress for the tube side. These are the key indicators we normally use to check the fouling tendency and the heat transfer coefficient. In conclusion, the heat exchanger was overspecified and purely designed. The fouling potential can be mitigated at the design stage by carefully analyzing the process, mechanical and operational information. A fit for purpose solution, the column on the right, was studied by Floor to reduce the fouling tendency and therefore having a area expected heat transfer coefficients from 550 to 850 watt per square meter Kelvin, more or less. The so called modern no foul design approach manipulates and adjusts key design parameters like the velocity and shear force, impingement roads tube wall temperatures, and many others to reduce the fouling tendency of the exchanger and enhance its thermal performances. These would perhaps require only over design margin on duty. As it can be seen in the scored card on the right, the required area is reduced with the consequent reduction of capex. The velocities in the shell and tube side are increased, leading to higher equipment thermal efficiency. The fouling tendency measured by means of B-flow fraction at the shell side and shear stress at the tube side is reduced and therefore the running time between cleaning cycles is increased. All these at the expenses of increased the pressure drops, but this loss in energy efficiency is well compensated and recovered by the improvement in thermal performances. The other example which shows the importance of heat integration studies is relevant to a revamp of an existing crude distillation column. As shown on the simplified process scheme, the crude is created with the process streams before entering the heater to reach the required operating temperature. The client was aiming at increasing the recovery of distillates with the installation of a new vacuum flasher to process the bottom stream of the crude column. There were two big constraints in the existing unit. The cold side of the freight train was hydraulically limited and the plot was extremely congested. In the original design developed internally by the client, there was no room for its integration between the existing and the new unit. The vacuum gas oil stream, which had high heat energy level, approximately 30 megawatt, was cooled by a steam generator, resulting in six new pieces of equipment. Floor started looking at the opportunities to recover the 30 megawatt for the VGO pump around stream, integrating it with the crude pre-train. The study required a multidisciplinary effort. The process started off building an accurate thermodynamic and hydraulic model of the existing pre-train to identify the best and worst performing heat exchangers and the hydraulic limitations. 
The heat transfer department studied the fit for purpose mechanical design for the new tech changer, reducing therefore the number of shells required to one. The plot designers identified the right location for the new exchangers to minimize pipe length, pines, and even construction time. The next slides shows the composite curves before and after the implementation of the floor solution. Composite curves are a good way to understand heat transfer systems. The y-axis has the temperature and the x-axis the total preheat duty. The hot side temperature are shown in red, while the cold side temperature are shown in blue. The difference between the hot and the cold side temperature is the driving force for the heat transfer. The worst performing heat exchanger is clearly visible from the picture on the left, circled in blue. The preheat duty contribution was very low, and we decided to remove it from the preheat train to allow for the installation of the new VGO cooler. The second composite curve shows how the new proposed solution had a considerable improvement in the performances of the pre train. The furnace inlet temperature, which is the end of the blue line, is significantly higher than the original case. If we have to quantify the benefit of the solution proposed by Fluor, the capex consisted of about $7 million with a saving of approximately 25 megawatt furnace duty. This design brings as much CO2 savings as removing approximately 30,000 cars per annum from the road. Considering a carbon tax of $50 per ton of CO2, the simple investment payback is three years. The next example is relevant to an aromatic complex consisting of a combination of several units to process naphtha streams and convert them into BTX. For this particular project, the licensor was selected based on the lowest energy intensity of the complex while maximizing the paraxylene's production. Over the years, licensor of aromatics complexes have made important steps to reduce the energy intensity. This has been possible applying not only interunit heat integration and key features like heat pumps, plate and frame exchanger design, divided wood columns, but allowing also for intra unit heat integration, which accounts for approximately one third of the energy input to the complex. This slide shows in a simplified way that in a non-integrated design, a considerable part of the heating and cooling steps in the units is provided by utilities like steam and cooling water. In an integrated design on the right, the use of utilities is replaced by inter and intra-unit process streams. The improvement in energy intensity implies several challenges, which need to be considered in design like the process operability challenges. For example, the process controllability is reduced and there are less degrees of freedom. Third down requirements might provide a smaller operating window. Startup and shutdowns are difficult and time consuming, and the designer shall consider features to overcome the initial energy input gap. For example, in the sketch on the right, you can see that there is an heater to fill that energy gap. Plant layout challenges, Intra-unit heat integration will lead to long vapor and to phase flow lines. And last but not less important, the safety challenges. The overpressure protection systems need to, to be deeply assessed since the, the inter and intra-unit integration will definitely lead to different relief scenarios and might have a considerable impact in the flare header size. All these challenges are only preliminary assessed by licensor and left to the engineering contractors for detailed development. This slide concludes the case studies we wanted to show. As we wrap up our presentation, we wanted to highlight some reference sources of information. Shown here are several good resources available to provide guidance on improving energy efficiency in operating facilities. Most of these are available for free online. We talked at the beginning how energy efficiency can be part of an industrial facility's overall decarbonization plan. On these slides, we have put two charts. 
The first one on the left is from Energy Academy Europe and shows a potential overall plan to go to zero carbon emissions by 2100. The analysis assumed that more than 50% of the reduction in carbon emissions in the year 2100 from the no carbonization approach to zero carbon emissions is assumed to be from improvements in energy efficiency, conservation and changes in behavior. Total energy consumption is still much higher than it currently is, but by only a factor of two, instead of a factor of more than four for the business as usual case. That's how important energy efficiency and conservation is expected to be. Without it, we will need more than twice as much new renewable energy. The second curve shows the four primary ways that an industrial facility can decarbonize. Energy efficiency, electrification, import of green hydrogen for fuel and carbon capture and the curve for approximate cumulative facility capex against the total amount of CO2 reduction. The slope of the curve depicts the relative cost efficiency as you move from the highest relative value, energy management, to the more expensive, lower value strategies. In reality, the cost of any specific opportunity for each of these categories will be project specific. So drawing it as a single curve is a gross simplification but it does show what we believe may be the typical relative cost versus benefit for each technique. Energy efficiency has the highest relative return on investment and is also usually the easiest to implement. In conclusion, using the proven techniques and procedures, expert knowledge, asking the right question and studying the options can make a significant difference in developing the optimum energy efficiency for a design. This concept can be applied to new designs and revamps of existing facilities. Some of you that viewed the Innovation Builders Electrification webinar that we produced last year may have noticed some common themes between electrification and energy efficiency. Some of the tools and techniques appear similar. In fact, we believe there are synergies in taking a combined look at energy efficiency and electrification in a combined decarbonization study. A combined decarbonization study can also include utilizing green hydrogen as a fuel and carbon capture. The, challenge, the challenges can be overcome or mitigated. We know that what those challenges are from working on many complex projects, and we know how to address those challenges. If you are not sure where to begin, we can help you devel develop a plan that starts with a small strategic study to determine your current status and where the potential aviators for decarbonization are in your facility that can make a difference. With that, we would be happy to respond to any questions that have come in. Thank you, Philomena and James. So let's take some questions. Start out with a question for James. So energy efficiency has been a focus for many years and most industrial complexes optimized their energy efficiency many years ago. James, why should a facility revisit this issue now? Well, many facilities have had a lot of changes in the last 20 years. Um, as, as example for refineries, they may have um, crude feedstock changes due to the availability of light tide oil. Um, some product specifications have changed, um, including the IMO 2020, and they may have differences in demand of different fuels between gasoline and diesel. For petrochemical facilities, particularly in the US, there's been a lot of changes in that any, any of them that had naphtha-fed steam crackers, they've probably converted them to, to using ethane or propane instead of naphtha. And this can have a big impact on the design. In addition, with the current focus on decarbonization, there's another reason to look at energy efficiency again. So I think a lot of facilities would benefit from taking a fresh look based on these changes at um, energy efficiency now. Thanks, James. Uh, Philomena, what are the barriers to implement energy efficiency measures on new or existing units in your view? 
Yeah, when designing a unit or industrial facilities, there are several actors who play a role in the decision making process. Uh, for example, I have in mind operation, maintenance, production, top management. Each one of them has a different drive, and it is important to well have all of them fully committed to meet energy efficiency targets. For example, it is important to evaluate the installation of the most innovative equipment solution, but we know that sometimes this can be the most expensive solution. But on the long run, the payback time can be proven to be short. Uh, operation and production should find the, the optimal operating window and continuously update the procedures. Same apply for maintenance. We need to keep track of the, the performances of equipment and then uh, if they are not performing, they should uh, uh, follow up and plan for resolutions. Thank you. James, question for you. Does the design phase include an evaluation of the carbon footprint of a process to provide a benchmark for potential reductions in the carbon footprint? Um, yeah, I would say a lot of our projects are doing that now. It's it's not a floor requirement at this point to calculate um, carbon footprint for facilities, but it's driven by the client. But many of our clients are definitely asking for that, and so we have um, experience doing that. Um, many clients have their own um, procedures or templates to use for that. Um, if they don't have that, then then you know we have one that we developed that that we can use to to do that overall. Carbon footprint calculation. Thank you. Philomena, if you're interested in putting together an energy efficiency program for existing facilities, what would be your approach? Uh, as James mentioned several times in the slides, uh, it is key to have uh, a very good uh, utility summary. So the approach would be to start, um, we would have to start with the energy audit where we uh, set the boundaries of the system we are looking at. Then we would uh, uh, compile the utility requirements. And uh, uh, once we have done the energy audit, we would go deeper, uh, probably at the process flow diagram level and the equipment level. And uh, we would look, for example, at Mm, techniques like uh, heat integration, uh, uh, analyzing also the best uh, uh, operating window. Um, we would also look at the best available techniques which are applicable for the facilities. And uh, we would identify comparing with the benchmark data or the, the top performance performance of the facilities, which are the um, worst performing uh, equipment or systems. We would uh, then identify the, the solutions per each uh, um, energy efficiency challenge, let's say. And then uh, we would uh, um, consider to rank the solutions based on uh, criteria developed together with the client or defined by the client themselves. Thank you. So, James, what are some energy specific? some specific energy saving ideas in utility systems? Well, if you look at utility systems, again, I think it helps to look at where, where the, you know, where the energy is consumed or, or lost. And I think a lot of that would be in steam systems. So um, one common place to try to um, improve the overall energy efficiency is to optimize that system in terms of the condensate recovery and makeup. There's some facilities that recover very little of that condensate, and so they have to, to you know, make new water and treat it and get it ready and, and up to the conditions and so forth. Um, you know, likewise, um, having re recovering steam from higher pressure steam. Um, that that's at condensate at a higher pressure and then having it flash so that you can recover some of the medium pressure steam. Um, having those you know, breaks in there can make the utility systems more efficient. But Philomena, is there anything that that you want, would want to add to that topic? I think you nailed the majority of uh, system we would look at. 
Are there any others you would recommend for non-utility systems? Uh, as far as, I mean, I, I think we tried to talk through our general approach. Um, every, every unit and process is, is unique. So um, we would look at each one in, individually. Um, as, as I mentioned before, a lot of times we will start with a design from a licensor or a client and find ideas to, to further improve, improve the process. But again, using the techniques that we talked about and looking at what are, what are ways to potentially make it better, you know, ask what if. Yeah, if I may, one of the, let's say, the major producer of CO2 emissions in uh, industrial facilities are the heaters. So heaters are, if they are well designed, they can also give uh, a considerable reduction in CO2 emissions and energy uh, improvements. Yeah, particularly older heaters and some yep. that maybe didn't have air preheat systems built in yep. originally. All great ideas. Well, uh, thank you, James. Thank you, Philomena. Um, that's all the time we have for questions today. And certainly thank you both for the time that you spent today and in preparation for our webinar. Thank you to our audience for attending. And you've all been a very engaged audience, and it's been a pleasure being your moderator. To our audience, uh, once again, thank you for joining us. and. Please continue to stay informed of these webinars by visiting the Innovation Builders page on floor.com or by following our social media channels using hashtag Innovation Builders. If you'd like to receive email notifications of future webinars, please email us at innovation.builders at floor.com with opt-in in the subject line. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for joining, for joining today. We will send out a compiled list of the Q&As within a few days, along with a notification that the webinar recording is available for replay on floor.com. If you have any questions or require additional information, please email us and our team will get back to us. Get back to you, sorry. <laughs> From all of us on the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day. Mm -hmm.